Welcome back to When Harry Met Board Games, where we feed our people with relatable content, and our victory condition is your satisfaction. I'm Harry, and today we have another list for you all. Today we have a top five. I'm going to be sharing with you guys my top five games designed by Richard Garfield. And Richard Garfield is a designer in the industry of much renown. He is definitely prolific and has had a very long career and has managed to stay relevant for about three decades now. Now, if you have never played a Richard Garfield game, I'm pretty sure you've at least heard of some of his games. For example, games like Magic the Gathering, which have a very strong cult following. It's almost impossible to not have had have heard of this game at some point during the course of your life. So, without any further ado, let's get straight to the list. First, before we go into the top five proper, I do have an honorable mention. A number six didn't quite make it to the list, and that is Robo Rally. And for those who know the history be behind Richard Garfield and his very successful uh, career here, his legendary career at this point, Robo Rally was his first venture into board game design. I believe he was working on Robo Rally. As far back as the 1980s, Richard Garfield had his origins in computer programming, I believe. And he was working on this game, and he was trying to get companies to publish this game. And the story goes that he finally got Wizards of the Coast to agree to publish this game. But part of that deal was that he had to work on a smaller, marketable card game, which was Magic the Gathering, in order to fund this game. Will Magic the Gathering make it onto this list? Time will tell. But this game here is a action program selection game, and it's basically the innovator of its kind. Players are moving. The Basically, players all take the control of of uh, different robots in a factory and they're racing because that's what they do on their free time and based on the map that you create you can make bigger larger more grandiose races or you can have smaller more compact quick uh to finish races and you're moving and maneuvering your little robots along the grid spaces of the factory but in order to do this you're placing particular cards down face down and these cards tell you that you can move one space forward or you can rotate the uh, orientation of your robot 90 degrees left or 90 degrees right or you can make a complete um, u-turn or what have you you could repeat an action maybe you could move up three spaces consecutively and you're doing all of this but as you're doing this there's a timer and all the players are simultaneously choosing their actions and then once all players have done so they will reveal their actions in turn order and execute them and when you carry out the actions that's when you realize that perhaps you did not map out your decisions as best as you could because you're kind of uh, projecting forward as you're making decisions and you're anticipating what's going to happen. You're anticipating what the other robots around the factory might be doing. You're anticipating what some of the obstacles or the features on the particular uh, map board, uh, what they can do. Perhaps you have conveyor belts that might uh, make you continue moving throughout the board. They might actually make you slide off the board, which hurts you and makes you uh, accrue different negative cards like spam cards and virus cards that are actually uh, detrimental to your future programming plans. But it's a really, really cool, neat game. I like the idea of just mapping out your turn ahead of time. You're making basically five decisions at once, and then you're executing. You do not have the chance to react in between. Really cool, but at the same time, it is a little bit antiquated. It is a little bit outdated, and there are other action program selection games that perhaps do it better and fresher nowadays. But gets an honorable mention as my number six, Robo Rally. And now my number five board game designed by Richard Garfield, perhaps many people's number one, and that is King of Tokyo. And King of Tokyo is such a blast. This is such a joy of a game to play. And an argument might be made that this is the most fun game out of all the games on this list. Well, why is it only number five? This game is very much a filler. This game is a very quick game, very lighthearted game, where players take on the role of different monsters trying to take control of Tokyo. And Tokyo is just represented by a single space on a board, or maybe two spaces on the board, with Tokyo Bay being indicated, depending on a higher player count. However, only one player can occupy that one spot of Tokyo at a time, and all the other players are attacking the one character that's currently in Tokyo. The player who's in Tokyo has has the advantage of being able to attack all of the other players simultaneously. And you're rolling these dice and you're basically rolling them Yahtzee style. You basically have six dice to start off with and they have different sides of the dice that uh, 
grant different abilities or different benefits to the players. For example, if you roll claws, that's the way you attack your opponents. If you roll hearts, that's the way you heal your character. However, you cannot heal while you are in Tokyo. You need to be outside of Tokyo to heal. And you're trying to manage that balance of attacking, but also keeping your health high enough because that is one of the ways that you lose the game. This game definitely includes player elimination. When your character runs out of health, they are gone and you are out of the game. But what's really cool about this game is that while... Uh, eliminating all of your opponents, all opposition, and, and devouring them is one of the ways that you can win the game. You can also win this game in a very Euro-like fashion because there are victory points in this game. One of the other things that the dice produces for you are different numbers. And if you get three of a kind of one number, a one, a two, or a three, then you're going to score the corresponding amount of points. If you get additional dice out of those six dice uh, that's uh, on top or surplus to those three of a kind, then you'll get one additional point for each of those. So you can kind of take whatever approach you want with this game, which is what I like, because while I do not, I am not, um, I do not evade or avoid conflict heavy games, I don't necessarily like to be the one who initiates conflict so much. And this game uh, creates that option for me because for the most part, I try to do just a little bit of combat, but I am trying to score points and win the game with victory points. And I believe every time I've ever won this game has been with victory points, but I've also been the victim of lots of eliminations uh, over the course of many plays. Really fun, really cool. If you add the power-up or um, expansion, it makes each of the different characters actually different from one another. It makes them asymmetric. You have a little deck of cards that you can use for different actions that are specific to that particular character. Really cool my number five richard garfield game of all time king of tokyo and now we move on to my number four and this is a game that's not hardly ever talked about but i really enjoy this game and that is treasure hunter by queen games and this is basically uh richard garfield's answer to the seven wonders and sushi go phenomena because this is a pick and pass card drafting game basically we have a fantasy theme and we know the fantasy theme is very popular in the industry so you got the historical theme of seven wonders and you've got the food or culinary theme a sushi go and then here you got the fantasy theme right however this game is not nearly as successful as the uh, these other games and probably because it's not as um, intuitive or what have you even though seven wonders is not very intuitive with all those symbols but this game is really cool basically players are in this fantasy setting and the board consists of three different types of terrains and all of these different sections of the board are going to have different loot cards that are going to be placed on them and players are going to be doing this card draft and they're trying to have the most or the least in particular colors so if you want to explore the blue area then you're going to be, as you're drafting the cards and doing the pick and pass, you're going to be wanting to draft blue cards that either have high numerical values, so you have the maximum uh, amount in that area if you like what the loot or the reward is for the maximum, or if you like what the reward is on the minimum side of things, then you're going to probably try to have the lowest numbers in that same color, right? But you're going to have to have a number in that color uh, in order to qualify for either one. You cannot just have nothing there, right? And you're doing all this, but you're drafting other cards along the way. You're drafting different dogs because dogs are going to help you fend off these different goblins because at the end of each round, the goblins are going to attack and they're going to collect some of your money and your money is your victory points at the end of the game. So you're recruiting some dogs. You're also recruiting some coin cards along the way because they'll help you score points at the end of each round as well. And basically, again, you're just managing the decision of which of these areas do you want to draft the colors in? Do, you, do I want to focus on green? Do I want to fo focus on red? And after you go a few turns around, you kind of have an idea what your chances are in each of the respective colors, and then you can make some adjustments as far as you what you draft going forward. But it's really cool because sometimes these uh, rewards are always placed randomly, and we don't know what's going to be going to be where. But sometimes the better reward is actually on the lower number, and that's such a more intricate thing to manipulate, right? Sometimes it's a little bit more straightforward to have the most or the highest in a particular color, but having the least or the fewest in a color is really, really tough. You might get really lucky and, and draft a number two card and be like, oh, well, there's a really good chance I'm going to have the lowest. But then when everybody reveals, you'll see that someone already took the number one card and that's the only card they have in that color. And they actually have a lower total than you do and you wasted your time, right? Now, sometimes what happens is that one of these 
uh, rewards is actually something harmful, something detrimental, something that subtracts many points from you. And at this point, you do not want to even have any colors, any cards in the color of that location because you don't want to take the chance of being the one with the highest or with the lowest. So managing all this is really cool, really neat. This game is highly replayable, lots of fun. Always want to play this a couple times in a row. My number four Richard Garfield game of all time treasure hunter my number three game of all time designed by richard garfield and this is his claim to fame so lots of people are gonna freak out over this and that is magic the gathering and this game again as i mentioned earlier in the video has a very strong cult following this is what lots of people refer to as a lifestyle game lots of the people who play magic the gathering only play Magic the Gathering. And many of those people would not respect my opinion as far as this game being number three and probably wouldn't respect the fact that I don't play this game nearly as much as they do. But I do appreciate this game. Now, first of all, I do not do the booster pack or CCG type of model. I don't really buy into that because... Again, that's like an endless pursuit to try to build the perfect deck and collect as many uh, rares and ultra rares as possible. And I, quite frankly, don't have the funds to do that and also amass a wealth of other board games. So I choose the latter. Now, the thing with Magic the Gathering is that they do recently, in recent years, they've offered these different uh, packages. You have what they refer to as uh, dual decks, which are two asymmetric decks that come in one package. And they are very particularly designed to kind of contrast one another and to be well balanced as far as facing each other. And you already have the deck pre-constructed and made it. All you have to do is shuffle it up and play the game. And that's the way that I enjoy it. They also come out with lots of things like commander decks and other ways of making the game more accessible and more available to more casual players. Uh, this game is really neat. It has innovated so many cool ideas so many of the ccgs lcgs or even lots of these modern two-player tactical card games owe their inspiration to games like magic the gathering even the very popular uh deck building genre owes its uh, existence to magic the gathering lots of these designers who have made these board games these deck building games have either been designers for particular cards on magic the gathering or they have been tournament level players and they've been inspired, of course, have implemented lots of these ideas and carried them over into the deck building genre. But Magic the Gathering is the pioneer, it's the innovator, fantasy theme. Players are doing a summoner versus summoner type of battle where you're casting spells and creatures and making particular decisions to attack one another and ultimately reduce the life of your opponent from 20 to 0. Really cool. I do own a few of these um packs of these um dual decks and i feel like that's just enough for me for the frequency that i play with but i do appreciate this game and every time i get it to the table whether i win lose or even get crushed i always enjoy it my number three richard garfield game of all time magic the gathering and now my number two richard garfield game of all time and for many people again i've been saying this over and over again this is their number one game the latest craze and that is Key Forge from Fantasy Flight Games. And first of all, I must point out that not only am I a Richard Garfield fan, not only am I a card game fan and a tactical card game fan, but I'm a big fan of Fantasy Flight and its uh, living card game line of games. And Key Forge definitely falls into that line of games, although it's not referred to as an LCG, but in essence, it has lots of similarities. They do offer the booster packs uh, in this game, but unlike... Uh, Magic the Gathering and the typical CCG model, these booster packs, uh, while they're all different and you don't know what's inside, they also come ready to play. You do not just buy a booster pack and get a whole bunch of uh, useless commons and, and lands and what have you. Uh, instead, here, you get a deck that is pre-made and particularly uh, generated, computer generated, in order to be uh, immediately usable for play and that's really really cool so every time you buy a booster pack it's going to be a different game because basically in this game you have a whole bunch of these different factions and the each deck has three 
factions. It has a configuration of three particular factions that have been combined. And there's some overlap from deck to deck as far as some of those factions. Some of those factions will make it, or all those factions will make it through lots of decks. But that particular combination of three factions is unique to that one deck that you're using. And that deck has a name and what have you. And it, even the particular cards within that faction are, are not necessarily... Uh, going to be from one deck to another. Probably doing a terrible job explaining this game and explaining its model, but let me get to the gameplay. Basically, players are trying to forge their three keys, and in order to forge their three keys, they need to gather enough ember. Every time they gather six ember, they are able to forge one of their keys, and the first player to forge the three keys is the winner. However, to collect that ember is quite a challenge because you have to play certain cards that allow you to recruit those ember. Sometimes you play character cards Cards that you can use to reap further ember but your opponent is attacking you and quite often using actions not only to benefit him or her in their acquisition or their gaining of ember tokens but they're also playing cards that make them capture temporarily some of your ember holding you back and and delaying your efforts to eventually forge your keys or they can even straight up steal your ember and take it from your pool and add it to their pool and therefore increase their chances of forging their keys before you. And just managing all this and having the right amount of cards there in order to protect yourself and defend yourself and to execute particular actions. What's really cool about this game is that at the beginning of each turn, you got to choose one of your three factions. And then you can play and activate as many cards as you want to or can from that specific faction so it's all about timing and sometimes you're going to be forced to choose a faction that you don't have many cards uh to execute with but sometimes you're going to map out an awesome epic turn where you'll be able to call out a faction choose that faction and maybe execute like six or seven actions because you set yourself up for that kind of turn Really cool, really fun. Again, highly replayable with all the different decks that are out there. First of all, the starting, the starting boxes. I think they're on their fifth um, starting box right now. And then you've got an infinite amount of booster packs for all of these uh, different starting boxes. Really cool, great model, great game. My number two Richard Garfield game of all time, Keyforge. And now we move on to the number one. And as I've been saying with pretty much this whole list, this is probably going to be lots of people's number one. With the exception of Treasure Hunter, which is one of the more forgotten Richard Garfield games. All these other games all have a very strong cult following, especially Magic the Gathering. But my number one of all time is... Android Netrunner and this game here while it has been reinvented and remade by Fantasy Flight Games and in particular Lucas Litzinger the original design of Netrunner was made by Richard Garfield not too long after Magic the Gathering about three or four years after Magic the Gathering he came out with Netrunner now that game eventually went out of print it was nowhere nearly as successful as Magic the Gathering but Fantasy, F Fantasy Flight earned the rights or bought the rights to this game and basically reinvented it and re-implemented it within their Android universe and they've got like five or six games at this point within the Android universe including a role-playing game and this game here, again, reinvented by Lucas Litzinger, and I'm sure lots of changes were made, but man, this game is phenomenal. I mean, first of all, um, one of the weaknesses or knocks on this game is also one of its greatest strengths, which is the overly emphasized asymmetry. This game is so asymmetric. The two different uh, players, this is a two-player only game, are so different from one another that not only is their end game objective different, not only is the way that they organize their tableau different, but the terminology that's used for the same elements of gameplay, of components, is different from one player to the other, just to keep within the theme of this futuristic... Um, dystopian universe with corrupt organizations and corporations and these hackers and net runners who are trying to break into their servers uh break into um hack their systems and come out with data and 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 capture their agendas and steal their their agendas and their plans in order to win the game it's so cool how they execute this thematically and how they use the terminology but at the same time it does make it a bear to learn as a matter of fact there's only one other person i play this game with and that's my friend andrew and that's because 
the task of teaching this game to him, to myself, and kind of revisiting and relearning this game every time we play because we don't play often enough. This is not a lifestyle game for us. So we kind of have to revisit the rules and rehash the rules and learn a little bit every time. The task is so, so gruesome, so difficult, so tumultuous that I decided to not even teach this game to anybody else as long as Andrew is willing to indulge me and play it. But it is such a fun experience. First of all, I've only played from one side. Again, this is a two-sided game. I've never played the runner. I've always played the corporation. And it is so fun because it appeals to my likings and my um, preferences as a gamer. It suits me uh, like a glove because the... The um, corporation is not necessarily concerned with attacking the Netrunner. Instead, they're concerned with the protection of their servers. And they're playing down cards that represent ice that are basically a buffer or a shield between the Netrunner and the corporation's servers. And you are trying to play, you're kind of playing a little game of chicken because you're placing down agendas face down and you're hoping to advance them before your opponent can capture them and steal them. But... You might be bluffing and you might be leading uh, the opponent on a wild goose hunt because, again, the cards are face down and the opponent might think that that's an agenda, but really it's an asset that you could advance as if it were an agenda. And sometimes when the Netrunner ends up hacking into your system and finding out that it's an asset, sometimes the asset actually might even hurt them. The Netrunner, on the other hand, has a much more attack-heavy approach where everything they do from placing down programs to hardware to resources is all in the efforts of strengthening and increasing their chances of breaking through ice and hacking into servers and hopefully stealing different uh, agendas or destroying other more valuable assets as well. And basically the first player to steal or advance a total of seven points worth of agenda points is the winner of the game. Again, besides the fact that this game is so heavy to remember, it's not that it's so heavy mechanically, but there's so many little rules that you have to keep in mind. Besides that little caveat, this is an amazingly fun game at two players. My number one Richard Garfield game of all time Netrunner. Android Netrunner. And that's it for today's list, folks. Thank you so much for joining us here. When Harry met board games, please comment down below and tell me what's your favorite Richard Garfield game of all time. Tell me what you think about my list and which games you disagree with. This is Harry saying take care, everybody. Stay safe, stay healthy, and have fun gaming. Bye-bye.